Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. Yo, it's your boy, the odd guy himself, Malik King Scott. Hi, I'm Charlie Edwards. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 131 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined this week by my partner in crime. He's back. It's Mr. Ayaz Sumra. Ayaz, how are you doing? I'm good, Joey. Yourself? Very good, my friend. Very good. It's good to have you back on the show. Um, obviously, last week when Mimi Melendez stepped in for you, we didn't do the news. So there's quite a few little bits to go over, I'm sure. We'll get to that in part two of the show. But part one, of course, as always, starts with the review. And we're going to start last Thursday. So um, a week ago now today, on the 12th of April, this was one fight to mention that took place over in the Fantasy Springs Casino in Indio, California, USA. Um, on this bill here, Francisco Vargas, 24-1 and one with two draws. Once again, that's the guy who um, almost sliced off Stephen Smith's ear. Um, he took on Rod Salka, former victim of Danny Garcia. Um, it ended up being a retirement in... Well, after six rounds, a retirement on the stall, I believe. Um, Salka was actually down once in round five as well. Salka, funny enough, well, I shouldn't say funny enough, but he was wearing these shorts that had, you know, like brickwork kind of pattern on them. And apparently on the back of the shorts, they said build the wall. And it was kind of some kind of um, dig, I suppose, at Francisco Vargas being Mexican. So a bit of a, you know, racist kind of thing to do there. And a lot of people are very happy that he got, you know, he got stopped in the end. So um, I'm not quite sure the, the the thinking behind that one, Rod Salka, but um, it, it went awfully wrong for him. He went down like a ton of bricks and that was that. Moving over now to Friday, the 13th of April. One fight to mention over in Mexico, actually. Um, a guy on this bill who many people may not have heard of, but anyway, his name is Justin Mayweather Jones. He moved to 4-0. and It was a unanimous decision over six rounds against 2-5 and five Luis Granados. Basically, Justin Mayweather Jones is actually the son of Floyd Mayweather Sr., and he had no idea that he had a son. And after years and years, I think maybe, I'm not sure how old this guy is. I think he's, um, let me just check, he's, he's 30 years old, this guy. And he's actually, like I say, the half-brother of Floyd Mayweather. You know, Floyd Mayweather Jr. And um, yeah, Floyd Mayweather Sr. never even knew that this son existed. And I think that when they did find out eventually, you know, that they were related, well, they were father and son. Um, Floyd Mayweather Sr. is now training Justin Mayweather Jones. So that's quite interesting there. If you if you have a look at what he looks like, he looks a spitting image of Floyd Mayweather Jr. So 100% got those Mayweather genes. Um Moving over now to another part of Mexico, former uh, recent foe, actually, of of Josh Taylor, Miguel Vasquez. He returned with a win. He's now 40-6. and six. He moved to win number 40, a win there against Cosme Rivera, who was 43-24 and 24 with three draws. That was a 10-round unanimous decision. Moving over now to the Doncaster Dome in Yorkshire, United Kingdom. Again, a lot of small shows here. Um, you know, all over the world. Robbie Barrett, former British champion, moved to 16 wins. He's got three losses in the one draw. It was a points win over eight rounds against Jordan Ellison, 9-12, and 12, now 9-13. and 13. Barrett was also cut along the way on his left eyebrow. Um, moving over now to the Minneapolis Armory in Minnesota, USA. Edna Cherry moved to 37-7 and seven with two draws. A unanimous decision win over 10 rounds against Dennis Galaza. Jamal James moved to 23-1. and one. It was a majority decision over 10 rounds against Abel Ramos. Um, and moving over to the King Power Stadium... Um, Sam Bowen ended up knocking out Maxi Hughes, a TKO in round eight there. Sam Bowen now 13-0. and He picked up the vacant British super featherweight title. Hughes, Maxi Hughes was down twice in the seventh round. And a timeout was called by, um, by Victor Lachlan after the bell to begin the eighth round. 
um, and and the bout was duly halted following a doctor's inspection of Maxie's right eye, which had become badly swollen. So a TKO there in round eight, and a very very big win there for Sam Bowen. It was really his first kind of big step up there against Maxie Hughes. Like I say, a guy that's been around the block. So a great win there for Sam Bowen. He's certainly one to watch. Um, the Europa Hotel in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Paul Highland Jr. moved to 18-0. and It was a TKO in round four against David Birmingham, who was um, who was 6-1 and one going in. Um, Paul Highland Jr., I believe, is now the mandatory to take on Lewis Ritson for the British title. That should be quite a good fight there. Two undefeated young fighters. And at the Ice Arena in Wales, Cardiff. Um, what do we have over here? Craig Kennedy, 17-1 and one now. It was a points win over eight rounds against Nicholas Grizunins, who was 7-0 and oh with one draw. Um, Nathan Forley ended up beating Adam Jones. I do like Adam Jones, the journeyman. Eight round points decision there. Nathan Forley now 10-0. and oh. Liam Williams, he had a you know an opponent fall through at the last minute. He did end up fighting. It was a TKO in round three for him against Daryl Sharp. Relatively easy win there. Liam Williams now 17-2 with one draw. Um, and the main event there, Ashley Brace picked up the EBU European female super flyweight title. It was a unanimous decision over 10 two-minute rounds. She's now 8-0 with one draw against Xenia, um, Xenia Ginorak, I think it said. She's now 8-3. Um, and finally, finally, on Sunday the 15th of April... A humongous upset that happened over in the uh, the the arena in Kanagawa, Japan. Christopher Rosales, former opponent of Andrew Selby. I remember he dropped Selby in the first round, and then Andrew Selby absolutely boxed his head off to a points win. Well, he got in there as a massive underdog against Daigo Higa. This one was for the vacant WBC World Flyweight title. Boy, oh boy, Daigo Higa 15-0 and going in, a bit of a puncher as well. I think he had 13 knockouts. Well, apparently he looked really, really bad on the scales. He looked really, really bad on fight week. And Christopher Rosales turned up and showed up in his performance. 27-3 and now. He takes the O of Daigo Higa. It ended up being a knockout in the ninth round, a TKO there. Apparently, Christopher Rosales was actually winning the fight as well on two judges' scorecards. The other judge having it a draw. That might be quite lenient. Um, Daigo Higa also failed to make the weight, so the title was only on the line for Rosales. And I tell you what, an opportunity there that came knocking for him, and he took it. Boy, oh boy, did he take it. And like I say, I'm sure Andrew Selby now will be, you know, licking his lips for a rematch with Christopher Rosales. I'm sure that they'll probably put up the money to get him to come back over here. And if I'm not mistaken, I want further clarification, but if I'm not mistaken, I think Andrew Selby's um, European title fight that was set to happen in about three weeks or two weeks from now, I think that that's fell through now, so perhaps he'd want to jump straight in there with Christopher Rosales. Like I say, his record now 27-3. and He's only young. I think he's only 23 or 24 years of age, so I'm really pleased for him. Um... And the final fight to mention, Ryota Morata, 13-1, and moved to 14-1. and It was a TKO in round 8 against Emanuele Blandamura. That one was for the WBA World Middleweight title. Um, like I say, an 8th round TKO. Blandamura, that's the third time he's been stopped. And all three times have happened in round 8. So it's a really... Um, bad luck round for him. I remember Billy Joe Saunders stopping him brutally in round eight also. So a good win there for Ryota Morata. A successful defense of his world title. And that's really it for the reviewing. Just before we wrap up part one, there's one last thing to do. That, of course, is to welcome... I need to take a breather. Our first guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the new WBA international welterweight champion. It's the pretty boy, of course, Mr. Josh Kelly. Josh, welcome back on the show, my man. <laughs> What's happening, mate? You good? All good, my man. How are you? Yeah, I'm not bad. I'm not bad. I'm um, I'm enjoying the sun today, so everything's everything's good. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So, Josh, we last spoke back in December. I remember at the time you'd just beaten Hamil Caro. Um, we're speaking now on Thursday, April nineteenth. Yeah. You've just beaten former world champion Carlos Molina for the WBA international title. Please, if you could, Josh, just walk us through that fight round by round, if you can. Um, the game plan was to sort of keep it long and don't go looking for the stoppage sort of thing. 
And then, um, I mean, uh, to get mixed up with the Mexicans and to get mixed up inside and of his calibre and experience would just, just to be a bit silly. So the first round was just to feel our process to come out and um, feel him out and just to get, get to know what, he, what he's all about. And then after that, round by round, and just pick the pace up little by little and start finding the jab. Once the jab started getting home, it was um, it was hard work for him to, to sort of get in distance. You know? I thought it was I could have really stepped it up. I think it was the eighth round. I had him, I think I had him troubled a little bit. I think I could have stepped it up then, but um, I just wanted to do the 10 rounds and get them under my belt and sort of just push on from there because you can't get better experience than 10 rounds against a former world champion. So I didn't, I didn't hurt my hands. I didn't do anything silly, no cuts. Um, felt comfortable. So I was, I was really pleased. I mean, I thought it was going to be a bit, I thought it was a bit of a more boring performance as well normally put on, but I think that's what was needed, more of an educated performance this time, just to um to get the ten rounds in, under the belt and don't go looking for daft daft things. So I was happy. Yeah, it was a brilliant performance. Like I say, brilliant matchmaking. Obviously, you did the rounds. Very important against somebody like that. Not only that, but he's never been stopped, obviously, against all those no. lists, list of fantastic names he's boxed. Uh, did Carlos bring anything to the fight that surprised you at all? And also, did you surprise yeah. yourself with how comfortable you were? Yeah, that, that, that was what surprised us the most. I felt as though he was going to put a lot more pressure on than he did. I felt as though he did bring a little bit. He, he was always there in front of us, and I was at be switched on to his, his unorthodox rhythm. He's got a very unorthodox rhythm with his um, hands and feet. They sort of come at the, a different. Normally, you step with a jab and your hands in time with your feet, but his his feet would come first, and then his jab would follow. So after it was it was a bit weird, or his, or his jab would come first, and his feet would follow after, and it was all a bit out of time. So that was that that was a bit that. Took some getting used to it after the first round. I'd, I'd just it out, but um, beforehand, Adam and the team were saying he's quite. He, he doesn't look as good when you're watching him, but when you get in there, it'll be a lot more awkward and a lot better. And that's what it was. It was the case of that. Obviously, he was very tough as well. He was just a tough guy, and just, I knew how to survive. When I caught many shots, he'd go very low and come up with a swingy hook, or he'd try and push that jab. I knew when to fight back when he, I thought I was getting on top. But like you said, he's never been stopped. So all for the, all for that all for that reason. So it's good. And obviously, Josh, since you've turned pro, you haven't boxed anybody with a losing record. Nobody's really been able to complain or moan about your opponents. But to beat Carlos Molina, like we say, a former world champion and a man who I personally know was mentally well up for this fight in just your sixth yeah. fight is quite astounding to be honest is it difficult Josh sometimes to keep, <laughs> is it difficult sometimes to keep your feet on the ground um, no not at all not at all um, I don't I, I'm not really on I mean I'm on these social media platforms I've got I've got them I do post but I do have a lot of help from outside people with the social media so I'm not always on there reading stuff obviously reading the bad comments and the good comments because if you if you Elevated by the good comments of people, then you'd be on the down off the bad comments. So it's you, you got to just keep a level head, like I've always said, and just just do your thing. And I mean, no one sees it in the gym, really. Only me and Adam and the team know what I'm working on and the way I'm performing in the gym and against who in Spawn, etc. So I mean, um, it's all it's all coming together. I'm just I cannot not I cannot not be grounded with the likes of. Ryan Burnett, rounders. You got Michael Conlon. You got all the lads in the gym. You got Adam training you. You can't not be grounded. It's um, sort of a good atmosphere. And you you come to the gym and you, you have it. Um, sort of everyone says well done, and then it's back to work. So <laughs> it's on to the next one. So I can't, I can't wait. Yeah, the gym really does seem to be, you know, doing so well at the moment, obviously guided by the fantastic trainer Adam Booth and perhaps the even better yeah. photo bomber. He's a great photo bomber, Adam, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he's quite, you know, he's, he's a good crack, Adam. He's a good crack. <laughs> <laughs> I remember asking this question to Anthony Fowler once when I interviewed him, and I don't think I've yeah. asked you this before, but if you had to choose out of the 2016 Olympic boxers that have now turned pro, which one do you feel has got the most potential of all? Oh, 
it's hard, you know, because they're all, going, they're all coming at different rates. They're all yeah. moving at different rates. And you can see, like, Lawrence Coley boxed Isaac Chamberlain and that. In terms of experience, there wasn't a lot there between them, but the fact that it was on a massive stage at the O2 and the amount of hype what happened with that fight, that was experience in itself. A lot of that, a lot, a lot of that attention was close to world level attention. What people get, it was, it was, it was out this world. How, how mad that that fight went. I was talking to people who didn't even know about boxing. And then we're saying, oh, you want to watch the round to cause Alex Isaac Chamberlain fight? And I was like, oh, it'd be a good fight. Blah blah blah. So you got to take that on board. I mean, Cordina, obviously, his skill set unreal. I've watched him in the gym. I've been there. Work tried him in the GB, and I know what he's about. He's so skilled and talented. Fowler, obviously, big puncher, really hard worker. So, Boati, you've got you, you got all them. Boati, so tough. You could, and he hits, he hits really hard, and he just, he's very grounded. I mean, I haven't, I haven't missed anyone out there ever. No, I don't think so. Um, I feel like, well, Joe Joyce, Joe Joyce, Joe Joyce, Joe Joyce, well, Joe Joyce is sort of moving quite fast under the radar. Obviously not with Matt Room, he's with um, David A. He's fighting, he's fighting Thomas, he's fighting, is it Thomas? Lenroy Thomas, yeah. Lenroy Thomas, that's it. And that's a, that's a good fight for your third fight. And I know they're looking for a fight with them, um, obviously me. Dave Tudora, which would be, ma- which would be massive step up. And um, so, I mean, you've got, you got all the lads moving at a great pace. So we just, I think once this, once we start finding our feet properly, then you can, you can tell what, at the moment, there's that much going on domestically and world level. I don't think you can really place place people who's going to get there first. Because at one point you look at someone, you say, "Yeah, he's flying," and then you say, "He will get this title, that title, and they blow it out of proportion." But if you think of the people who's holding the world titles in each division, there's a, there's a big big steps up to be made. So we just got to just keep our heads down and just keep focused. I mean, I'm just enjoying what I'm doing. I don't I don't really um focus on any of the Olympians. I wish them all the best and I'm I'm still friends with them but I'm just focused on my journey. Professional's more of a, a single minded thing. So it's um it's good it's good it's good to have been brought through with the lads and to um, know all them and really know what they're about. But I'm confident in all of them doing well as well as Michelle. Yeah, very well said. I, I think no I'm pretty sure actually when I asked Fowler that he said Buatsi had the most potential so yeah, um, uh, fair play. <laughs> so the, uh, next, the next step for you is June the sixteenth in Newcastle. Is that is that official now? Um, I'm thinking so. I'm, I'm, I mean, Eddie's put that out quite a bit. So I guess it'll get confirmed soon. So then we'll find out who who's the um, who's next and what for etc. So can't wait. Yeah, I saw that on Box Rec. I, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that that's right. But um, do you know at all if, if when you do fight, do you know if you'll be defending the the title? Um, I think they'll be looking for either defence of the title or, or we might be possibly going for another title. Or I'm not, I, I'm not too sure. I had them and Eddie keep each other close to the chest because they know I do overtime on people. So as soon as I find out or on boxing or when or where, I'm um, I'm on it. I'm, I'm just looking at them all the time and watching them, and I, I, I come into the gym. Adam, this is Adam. Look, this is what this is what they do. Da 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 da. Even if it's a, even with the first fight to this fight, I'm I'm like that. Then I stop watching them about three or four weeks out. So just keep the the play close to the chest. <laughs> Yeah, no, good, good stuff, good stuff. And um, obviously, Frankie Gavin's thrown his name into the hat again. I see. I know yeah. that his fight fell yeah. through. Is that is that? An, I think we spoke about this last time. But is that a fight that interests you? Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, he's 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 a top he's a top lad, Frankie. I've I've known him for for a while, and I mean, I think we were meant to. How much we were? Meant, I, I I don't really keep up to date with the matchmaking, etc. I don't really ask. I just sort of get the match and when it's confirmed I just concentrate on that but there was something about which we might have fought on the Joshua undercard just gone on the 31st but for some reason or another it didn't happen but um, he's, he's definitely a potential name so we're just we're just looking to move on and these steps big steps but I'm confident in taking them and coming through 
And in Britain right now, at welterweight, aside from Amir Khan, we don't really have many on the world level just yet. Just under that level, I suppose, you could say we've got Bradley Skeet. He'll be fighting for the European title next week, I believe. I know that you've yeah. sparred Ski, and I won't ask what happened in sparring, but he's known to be very, very awkward, Josh. Did you find him quite awkward when you were sparring? Yeah, he's awkward. He's a good friend, Bradley. So we um, we keep in touch a lot. And, uh, I mean, he, he always comes down and helps out with sparring and stuff and vice versa. So we know a lot about each other. He's got, he's, he's, he's got a very good jab, a very, very good jab. And people underestimate Bradley, and I rate him up there at the top, top level. I mean... I just think, I think if when he gets the time, the right time and the right opponent for the world title, I think he he go and win it. If if that, if that comes up, like you said, he's there and thereabouts now. I, I believe a shot with Jeff Horn dropped through um, before, so I think he would have come through that and in, in them flying colours. So I mean, he, yeah, he's all, but getting back to your point, he's very awkward and he's got a very good jab on him. So he's uh, he's not one to be messed about with. No. Good, good guy he is. And also, um, yeah. obviously, you know, after winning your title now, you're going to be ranked in the top 15 of the WBA. Uh, the WBA yeah. put out their rankings usually on the last day of each month. So because you boxed on what? the 31st, you just about missed getting into the latest rankings. In 11 days' time, <laughs> they'll be putting out April's rankings. You'll be Jeez. in there. You'll be in there. <laughs> do, you have to, do you have to pinch yourself sometimes, Josh? Because it's all just happening so fast for you, man. Yeah, it's, it's happening fast. I mean, I was I was just looking because I'm always looking. I never, I'm not one of these guys who are boxing go off the radar. I boxing sort of. I'm always looking, keeping. I'm I'm not always posting stuff on social media. But I'm always I'm always taking all. I'm always looking at stuff and I'm always keeping an eye on. But I was looking at Carlos Molina's ranking and he was ranked number thirteen in the IBF. I was like, I've got a bit of a shot. I thought, well, wow, that's a that's a bit of a good ranking. Do you know what I mean? Still to be ranked there. 13 in the IBF rankings, I think he was. So, if I, if I'm, well, if I've looked correctly, but that's when I think he was. I mean, in I thought that's 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 moving fast. I don't really like to look at the rankings at I just like to look at who are boxing, what they're like, not not where they're from or what they've done or what title they hold or where they rank. Purely because I think all that contributes to. Your, your mental preparation, etc. So I just let like, I just focus on him as a boxer. It's just a, I'm a boxer, he's a boxer. So to fight Carlos Molina in six fight, a lot of people were building up to be um, a big fight. But when I broke it down, just broke him down on on video by myself, I just thought I, I was really really confident in myself. I thought there's no way he he can beat this unless he brings something really 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 special or does something what I'm not seeing him do. Do you know what I mean? So. I, have to, I do have to pinch myself sometimes, but I mean, um, it's good. It's good that we're moving as fast because it just brings us on, makes us more mature. And then, I mean, 10 rounds underneath my belt and he's excited. It's good. <laughs> couldn't, ask for, couldn't ask for more. So, was it? It seems pretty crazy to be talking like this with a fighter that's only had six fights, but the phone may ring now at any time, you know, for one of for one of the big fights, for a world title fight. On the other end of the phone, in the WBA anyway, you'd have Keith Furman on the end of the phone, or possibly oh. Lucas Matisse on the other line, if he can get past Pacquiao. If Pacquiao beats Matisse uh. in July, Pacquiao might even be calling. Honestly, Josh, you know yourself. <laughs> You know yourself. Adam Booth knows you incredibly well. How much more time yeah. do you feel you need before stepping up like that? Well, I'm not too well. I'm not, I'm, I couldn't get. I could. It's a big call. I'd love to love to give you an answer, but I think you'd have to come back towards the end of the year, and we'd know, or towards at least after this fight, after this next fight, or the fight after. But I mean, um, we should know. We will soon know, and then. Um, these these names are always out there and they're always they're always lurking in the back of my mind because obviously if you come into boxing you want to get the, you want to get to the top you don't want to you, you, I think if you you mess about in the sport you can get hurt so I'm not here to mess about I'm not here to make numbers up I'm here to get to the top in this professional game and it's a totally different game than amateurs and it's sort of suited me down to the tea I've, um, I'm I'm enjoying it and I'm really really <laughs> seeing it pushing on like you said so these names are all floating about but you'll have to ask us after the next fight or maybe uh, towards the end of the year and we might get it um, 
it might get a surprise. I'm not sure. So. <laughs> No, by rights, you've you've got about five years of time really before stepping up to that level compared to uh, the, the normal person, you know. But you're just doing it at such be, a rate. <laughs> to be fair, realistically, I think if if I was me personally, but me personally, I would never have chose to fight Carlos Moreno in my sixth fight. So I'm I'm not the one really calling shots. But me personally, I think um, I'll always move faster than what I actually think I will because of Adam. Eddie, etc. So, um, I, I th- me, I think uh, it'll be another couple of years, but uh, with Adam and Eddie there, I'm, I'm guessing they're looking to move it a lot faster and they can see a lot more potential in it. So, I mean, just, I'll just play by ear and just, um, I'll just go with the flow. I'll always be ready to fight who and wh- whenever. So, no, just keep doing what you're doing. It's, it's working fantastically well. Just before I let you go, Josh, anything that you want to say at all to anybody that may be listening? I'm just buzzing about the support because a lot of people support us and really get behind us and messages. And I mean, it's just mad. I can't. I don't really take it all in sometimes. I'm just but when I sit and think about it, like on the days out of day when I've got a little bit downtime, I sit and think about things. Just sit and think. I'm really, really lucky. Really lucky in the sense that. I've got all the support, it's not just from England, but around the world, and it's um, it's mad. But <laughs> just keep on supporting, and um, we'll we'll make a journey soon over to Vegas, hopefully. <laughs> and Josh, have you got any? Have you got any website at all where people can go and perhaps buy merchandise or whatever? Um, I haven't as of yet, but I mean, there's there's something what we're looking into because the following's getting a bit bigger, and people are asking for bits and pieces but I don't want to just put a, a, um, a t-shirt out there with PVK on about something like that I want to make it a nice a nice thing a nice sort of cool looking um, brand of, and what people want to wear don't want to just trust on for a fight people and wear it to walking about or training or whatever or going to go, going out with, not out out but out with a friend's shops and I don't want a, a, a um, shabby looking thing so we're just waiting we're just looking and um We'll be out soon, so just keep an eye on. Eyes peeled for that one. All right, listen, Josh, yeah. it's always my pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for coming on the show once again. Best of luck if you do fight on June 16th for that date, and we'll catch up sometime after, I'm sure. Right, thank you, boss. All good. Cheers, me. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part. Eyes. We didn't see you last week, of course, so I'm sure you've got quite a few little bits of juicy news. Take it away. Yes, finally. The big man, Tyson Fury, has come back and will fight on June the 9th with the undercard to be uh, Terry Flanagan versus Marius Hooker. Yes, of course. You just forgot to mention there, as he signed with Frank Warren. The most important thing is we're happy to see the big man back in the ring. Um, you know, June the 9th's not that far away. He looks in tremendous shape. I'm going to save what I've got to say, I think, for a little bit closer to fight night. But yeah, I'm just, I'm over the moon. Everybody knows I'm a huge Tyson Fury fan. So many people that listen to this podcast are. So I'm sure that, you know, I share the opinion that we're all happy that, that you know, he's, he's going to be back and he's signed a deal and all that stuff. So very, very pleased for him. It's also great that Terry Flanagan, who we had on our show a few weeks ago, he seemed to be raring to go when I spoke to him. And, um, you know, it seemed like when Billy Joe Saunders pulled out and that really messed up the April 14th card, we weren't too sure what was going to happen with with Terry Flanagan. It's good that that fight is happening and it's happening in Manchester. I'm sure he'll be very pleased about that. Um, Yeah, June the 9th for that one. Can't wait. Joe Joyce will challenge Lenroy Thomas for the Commonwealth heavyweight title on the undercard of David Hay versus Tony Bellew. Yeah, I'm quite surprised to see this one happen because obviously Eddie Hearn's involved in it. And I remember saying on this podcast a few weeks ago that I don't think Eddie Hearn would actually put, you know, Lemroy Thomas on one of his cards unless it's against Dave Allen. Now, it's very unfortunate for Dave Allen here. I mean, not that this now has anything to do with him, but with his cut, you know, and now, you know, Joe Joyce is going to probably, in my eyes, comfortably beat... Lemroy Thomas, I think that it really messes up um, 
Dave Allen's chances of picking up either the Commonwealth title or the British title, because it seems like Huey Fury's going to win the British title. But then again, Peter Fury said to me a couple of weeks ago that he's not going to have, you know, Huey Fury defending that title and trying to win it outright. So it seems to just be a, you know, a get back fight for Huey Fury. But staying on subject, I'm pleased for Joe Joyce again. I really applaud the way that they're moving him. They're seeming to, you know, fast track him, which they kind of have to do because of the age factor. But I really like this fight. I think that Joe Joyce is going to, you know, make Lenroy Thomas look very average. I know that Lenroy is a southpaw and, you know, that should be interesting. But, yeah, I really like that fight. And we'll be looking to try and get Joe Joyce on the show once again, um, hopefully in the near future. So, um, yeah, really looking forward to that fight. It's a very strong undercard on May 5th, I feel. Lots of 50-50s. Right. Mikey Garcia has relinquished his IBF belt. Yeah, um, I think that, you know, time was ticking. He had to either get rid of his WBC belt at 135 or his IBF belt that he took from Sergei Lipinets at 140. Um, you know, he was very fortunate to be able to hold a belt in two separate weight classes for the time that he did. Um, you know, phenomenal fighter. Obviously, he's he's on the intro of every show. We're huge fans of Mikey Garcia here. He's in both of our, you know, both of our pound for pound list size. And yeah, it's you know, he, he's had to give one up. So it looks like from from what he's doing that he's going to be moving back down to lightweight and hopefully looking for a unification. I'd like to see him take on Robert Easter Jr. in the meantime while Lomachenko's taking on Linares. But, um, yeah, it doesn't look like he's going to be at 140, which further kind of um, paves the way, if you like, for people like Regis Progre, because there's not really many people at 140 who I'd say gives him any problems, apart from Jose Carlos Ramirez. That's a great fight. But those two are really the one and two guys I'd feel in that division. Jarrett Hurd has relinquished his IBO belt after not paying his sanction fees. Yeah, um, the IBO belt was on the line when he took on Eris Landy Lara. Obviously, his own IBF belt was on the line and also Lara's WBA super belt. And I think Lara brought this IBO belt to the fight as well. But anyway, he didn't pay the sanctioning fees. He's, he's, you know, he's, he's basically decided he doesn't want the IBO title, which a few fighters do because, again, it's not a proper world title. So I don't want to say credit to him because, you know, it's, it is what it is. It's... I don't really care if he's got the IBO or not. It makes no odds to most people. So he doesn't want it. He didn't want to pay for it. And that's that. It just kind of is a bit of a kick in the face again for the IBO. Um, but it is what it is, you know. Paul Butler will face Emmanuel Rodriguez on the undercard of the David Hay versus Tony Bellew fight. Yeah, like I say, we mentioned the Joyce and and um, and and Lemroy Thomas fight. This is another fight for the, you know, for the undercard here. Um yeah, so so Paul Butler's stepping up. Do you know what? I'm not. I'm I'm really not sure about Paul Butler. He hasn't really impressed me since losing to Tete. It seems like he's really been treading water. I know that the fights haven't really been there for him, but since he lost to Tete, um, I mean, aside from the win against Stewie Hall, I suppose that was you know that was a decent win for him. But aside from that, he really hasn't impressed me. And yeah, he's taking on Emmanuel Rodriguez, who's undefeated, seventeen and zero with twelve knockouts. I actually will favour. Emmanuel Rodriguez in this fight when you look at his resume though I suppose when you do look at his resume he's kind of he's got one of those padded sort of you know I don't want to say Puerto Rican resumes but he's got one of those padded um I want to say Latino resumes because you see those guys that you know fight for the Latino belts and defend them loads and loads of times he's one of those guys there I think he's had about six or seven Latino title defenses and stuff like that but yeah it should be a good fight um I don't know it's, it's hard to say he's one of those ones really I kind of backtrack a little bit because Butler even though he hasn't looked so good he hasn't looked great. I mean, he he got beat by Tete in the fashion that he did. Stewie Hall, I don't think, is no great shakes, really. No disrespect to him. But, you know, Paul Butler has fought bigger names, I suppose, than this guy. So it's, it is hard. It is, it is hard to predict. But, you know, if the odds are good on this guy, I wouldn't mind putting a few quid on him because I feel like, you know, he's a, he's a big outsider. He's not a big name at all. And, you know, he, he really may well cause an upset, especially the fact that Butler just doesn't seem to be himself lately anyway. Gary Russell Jr. would defend his WBC featherweight title on May 19th against Joseph Diaz. 
Yeah, Joseph Diaz. Um, you know, he's a guy that has been really ticking all the boxes. He's been looking fantastic in all of his fights. He's been doing numbers on his opponents, to be honest. And he's got quite a fan base as well, so he's a very likable character. And in the other corner, like you say, Ayaz, um, Gary Russell Jr., who seems like he's just been so inactive. He's really been kind of having one fight a year since 2014. In fact, since 2014, he's only had three fights. He hasn't yet fought in 20. 2018, he's fought once in 2017, once in 2016, once in 2015. So um, you know he's he's been a he's been a title holder now. I think for just over three years, and he's only you know he's only defended the belt. I think two yeah two times. He, he won it and then defended it twice, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, Gary Russell. I mean, he's one of those guys. He lost that one fight to Lomachenko when Lomachenko was having his third professional fight. No shame in that. But, you know, since then, he has looked good, but the inactivity, you kind of feel like if it is going to bite him in his behind, it will be this fight. Joseph Diaz, like I say, 26-0. and 0. It's mad to think that Joseph Diaz has been a pro since 2012, and he's had 26 fights. Gary Russell Jr. has been a pro since 2009. He's had 29 fights. You know, he's just been so inactive lately, Gary Russell Jr. So if the ring rust is going to bite him, like I say, it's going to be in this fight. Um, Joseph Diaz is well up for this. He's been wanting this fight for a long, long time. Um, you know, he's got the youth on his side massively, you'd have to say. He's a southpaw. He's 5'6". Um, he is a southpaw versus southpaw affair. But you know, Gary Russell Jr. is only five foot four and a half. The size difference could play a part. We'll have to wait and see. But judging on both fighters at their best, you'd have to favour Gary Russell Jr. But I'm just not quite sure because we've only seen glimpses of it. I'm not quite sure. It makes this fight more of a 50 50 fight than it probably would have been if Gary Russell was showing us what he can do more and more and was a bit more active. So. Yeah, good fight, and I really applaud Joseph Diaz for stepping up for this fight, because it's a tough, tough one. You know, a lot of people don't want to fight Gary Russell Jr. That may be a part of why he doesn't fight so often. I know that Lee Selby has said many times that Gary Russell Jr., you know, he'd be a right handful for him. So, yeah, very, very, very good fight there. I'm looking forward to that one. And finally, Austin Trout will face Jamel Charlo for the WBC light middleweight title on June the 9th. Yeah, another fight. It's going to be a great night on June 9th, like you say there. We've got the Tyson Fury show and also this one here. Um, I'm very pleased for Austin Trout. Again, every time I speak to him on this show, I say he's a former world champion. And he says, I'm also a future world champion. Um, I know that he really wants to regain that world title status. You'd have to feel that this is a last chance saloon for him in terms of regaining a belt at that level. Um you know, it's, it's a very tough fight for him. He seemed to run out of steam in his last fight, but it was a great fight while it lasted against Jarrett Hurd. Um, Jamel Charlo, some people would say, is the best fighter at 154, so you'd, you'd have to favour him in this one. But what I will say is Jamel Charlo has been outboxed for large periods of fights, and I think that the slickness of, um, of, of Austin Trout could pose some threats to him, could cause him some problems early on, but it's just a case of can Austin Trout keep it up and can he stay away from Jamel Charlo's right hand bomb, which he seems to be detonating again and again now. So, um, yeah, a, a really good fight, that one, once again. Um, I, I really hope that Austin Trout can pull it off, but I think he certainly is the underdog for me. That's it for the news. Okay, Ayaz, thank you for updating myself and the listeners there. Moving over now to the preview part of the show tonight, later on tonight, Thursday the 19th of April at the Montreal Casino in Quebec, Canada. Former Olympian Oscar Rivas, 22-0, and 0, takes on Edson Antonio, 40-7 and 7 with one draw. I haven't heard of him, though, to be honest, so I might have to look at his resume, but that's an eight-rounder there. Moving over now to Germany, um... Over here we have Ajit Kabayel, the guy that beat Derek Chisora over in Monaco. He's 17 and oh, he puts his EBU European heavyweight title on the line against Miljan Rovkanin, who's 19 and one. 
Um, also on this bill, Tom Schwartz fights for the WBO Intercontinental Heavyweight title against Senad Gashi. So quite a good heavyweight bill there um, for Eastern Europe. Um, moving over now to Poland. One or two fights to mention over here. Matthias Mastanek, 40-4, takes on Yuri Kalenga, 23-4. That's going to be a great fight there. That one's for the WBO European Cruiserweight title. Quite a tough fight there for that belt. The hero of Poland, Thomas Adamek, 52-5, and five, takes on Joey Abel, 34-9. and nine. I remember Joey Abel taking on Tyson Fury a few years back at the Copper Box. Uh, I think I was there for that fight as well. And Joey Abel is a guy that either knocks you out or gets knocked out. The only thing he really does possess is a big punch, which is quite a threat, actually, at this stage in Thomas Adamek's career. That one's for the Republic of Poland international heavyweight title. So I'm not sure how Joey Abel qualifies to fight for that belt, but it is what it is. Moving over now to Sweden, a great heavyweight fight over here also, especially for the Swedish fans. Um, Otto Wallin, 19-0, takes on Adrian Granat, 15-1. Adrian Granat, I think, got upset, I think it was last year, on one of his, you know, one of the fights he was supposed to win. I think he lost that fight. That's why he's carrying the one loss. This one's for the vacant EBU European Union heavyweight title. So, um, that's quite a good dust-up there. Both guys from Sweden, that's like their two kind of biggest... um, prospects if you like i suppose you could call them both so that's quite a good fight there that one is a sourland card moving over now to the echo arena though let's start now with the predictions this one in liverpool merseyside united kingdom um i'm going to start with the undercard actually but get your predictions ready for some of the bigger fights here i as kes ashfak one and oh takes on ricky starkey two and five with two draws that's a four rounder there um, what else do we have? Tom Farrell gets out again. This is the first time, I think, since he lost to O'Hara Davies by knockout. His record 14-1. and one. Connor Ben, 11-0, and 0, takes on Chris Truman, 13-8 and 8 with two draws. Um, that's a six-rounder there. Scott Fitzgerald gets out again. Again, he was the guy that knocked out the Black Roy Jones Jr. in devastating fashion. Really um, exciting young fighter him. Um, Anthony Fowler, 5-0, and oh, his opponent yet to be announced, that's an 8-rounder there. Sam Eggington in his first fight at 154, it seems like we've had to wait quite a while for that. His record 21-4, and four. he takes on Ryan Toms, who's 15-14 and 14 with 3 draws. And that there is an 8-round contest. Um, Sean Masha Dodiaz, 15 and 2 with one draw, takes on Tommy Coyle, 23 and 4. It's a 12 rounder, it's for the Commonwealth lightweight title. How do you see that one? It's quite a 50 50 fight in my eyes. Yeah, I think it's a 50 50 fight. Obviously, Sean Masha Dodiaz and Tommy Coyle are both very good fighters. Um, I think it's, I think it's going to be a 12 round contest, but if I'm going to have to choose a winner, I'll probably have to go with Tommy Coyle. Tommy Coyle, and which method? Because, like I say, we're predicting. I'm going to go with the points win points win okay interesting tommy coyle for you um our listeners have gone with sean masha dodd to win on points um do you know what it's a tough fight to predict actually it's a tough fight to predict um i mean the thing with tommy coyle i think that you know he's got a lot of power and and a lot of people believe that he's got a load of power but when you actually look at his resume you know his knockout his knockout percentage is 41% um Sean Mashadod though when he does lose he does get stopped um he lost to Scott Cardle by stoppage again Scott Cardle's not a banger and he lost to Andy Townend who can bang so um it's tough, you know, it's, it's really tough because Sean Masha Dodd's got some great momentum at the moment, you know, ever since, you know, he lost to Scott Cardo, obviously, and, you know, he went on to sort of have quite a nice streak, actually. Um, oh, God, I'm really, I'm kind of sitting on the fence, but I can't because it's the prediction. So I'm going to go with, oh, gosh, I'm going to go with a Tommy Coyle, uh, I'm going to go with a Tommy Coyle stoppage. I'm actually going to go over Tommy Coyle's stoppage. So, a great fight there. Um, Really excited for that one once again. Um, Also on this bill, Natasha Jonas, 5-0, takes on Tausi El Hadji, who is 5-6 with one draw. That's a 10 two-minute round contest. Natasha Jonas was supposed to take on, I think her name's Vivian Albanalf, who 
obviously got beat by Chantel Cameron and also got beat by Katie Taylor. I did want to see that fight because it would have been a bit of a measuring stick kind of fight, but that fight, for whatever reason, has fallen through, so it's a late replacement here. And the main event, of course, Ayaz, I'm going to come to you first. Amir Khan, 31-4, and four, takes on Phil Greco, 28-3, and three, a 12-round contest return of King Khan. Oh, yes, I can't wait for a return of King Khan. He's been out for the ring for two years, obviously, um, obviously, because of the Canelo, uh, Canelo, because uh, since that devastating knockout with the Canelo, he's had a bit of family issues. He's been in the jungle, a lot, of, a lot of a lot of things has gone around in the, in his life actually, right? Obviously, at the moment, he's replaced um, Virgil Hunter because uh, with Joe Goosen due to the fact that Virgil Hunter um, has got health problems. But I'm looking forward to this fight because Phil Lagreca is actually com- actually coming in to knock Amir Khan out. I want to see what Amir Khan is like after since being out for two years. This is a must-win fight for Khan, obviously, and this is his first fight under Eddie Hearn. Right, if I'm going to go with a winner, I'm going to go with Khan, but I'm going to go with Khan with a points win. Yeah, I'm going with Khan with a points win as well. Our listeners, it was very, very close with the predictions, but our listeners have just about, by 3%, gone with Khan to win by knockout over points. Um, I agree with you, Ayaz. I think that Phil LaGreco is coming in here to knock Khan out. I think that's really the only chance he's got. He's not going to outbox Khan. A lot of people are bashing Khan for this return opponent. Now, I just want to say to those people there, let's let's seriously ever think about this now. Amir Khan is not scared of nobody. He's took on some crazy names. He took on, you know, I don't even need to sit here reeling them off. He's took on about 14 or 15 previous present or future world champions and you know he's shown many many times that he's prepared to fight anybody he's been knocked out trying to achieve greatness he's took on so many good fighters over the years beaten them come up short all that kind of thing and um you know he's he's surely entitled to have you know an opponent who's not on that kind of world level. He's coming off of a knockout loss, a brutal knockout loss, and two years inactivity. How can we be mad at this return opponent? I just don't understand the logic there. This is, you know, this is quite a solid fighter, Phil LaGreco. He's not really put a foot wrong. Aside, obviously, he got knocked out once by Errol Spence Jr. No shame in that. Everybody's saying he's the next best thing. Um, You know, he did go the distance with Sean Porter, who I think is quite a banger, Sean Porter. So for me, that's really the reason. If if Sean Porter can't get you out of there in a 10-round contest, then I think Amir Khan would struggle to get him out of there. Um, he did lose actually recently in, in, well, I say recently, it was actually, um, in June 2016 to relatively unknown Joseph Elegele, who, you know, we don't know too much about, but aside from that, you know, he's coming off a majority decision win over a guy called Jesus Garola, who was 24 and 11. That was in June of 2017. He hasn't been really too active himself. I mean, since June 2016, Amir Khan fought in May 2016, so kind of about the same time. Phil Greco has only had one fight since then, and like I say, it was a majority decision over eight rounds against a guy who we don't really know too well. So he hasn't got a really great, impressive resume, but you know he's, he's half a name. He is half a name, to be fair to him, and. You know, I'm definitely giving Amir Khan a pass with this opponent, but for me, I think Khan will outwork him down the stretch. Um, hopefully, we don't see Khan look in danger at any point. I wouldn't like to see him get rocked or anything like that, which very, very possibly could happen. Um, I'd like to see the odds, actually, on Amir Khan being knocked down and then to get up and win still on points. I think those those would be quite lucrative odds. But, um, yeah, for me, I think Khan wins on points. So it's, it seems like a quite an interesting prediction league this week. That's it for that card. That's obviously going to be at the Echo Arena, Liverpool, Merseyside. It's going to be shown exclusively live on Sky Sports. Um, remember, though, don't make the mistake and watch it on Sky Sports main event. Watch it on Sky Sports Arena or Sky Sports Action. It's one of them. I always get confused between the two. But, yeah, it's on that channel about an hour before it's on main event. I I made that same mistake myself the other day and completely missed half an hour of one of um, one of the cards. I think it was... Um I think it was a card that Derek Chisora was on. I missed that whole ringside beef between him and David Hay. Anyways, moving over now to the SSE Arena in Belfast, Northern Ireland, United Kingdom. Some would argue the better card of the evening. This one's going to be shown on Box Nation and on BT Sports in the UK. 
on the undercard here, what do we have? What do we have? What do we have? Comrade Cummins, 13-1 and one with one draw, takes on Luke Keeler. That's a 10-round contest there. Luke Keeler, 13-2 and two with one draw. Very, very good fight, that one, by the way. Very good fight. Quite a 50-50. Tyrone McKenna, 15-0 and oh with one draw, takes on Anthony Upton, 17-1. and one. That's another great, great 50-50 there. That's a 10-rounder. Um, Zolani Tete, 26-3, and three, takes on Omar Navarez, who is... 48 and 2 with two draws. He's been around forever. He really has. That one's for the WBO World Bantamweight title, Zelani Tete's title. I strongly believe he'll win this fight by knockout and look good. Um, also, it's happening in the territory, if you like, of Ryan Burnett. And um, Carl Frampton, 24 and 1, fights for the interim WBO World Featherweight title against Nanito Donaire, 38 and 4. That's a 12 rounder. And I tell you what, I had a lot of people writing off Nanito Donaire due to his recent performances, but I have that fight dead level. Oh, yes. A lot of people are writing off Nanito Donaire, but let me say something. Nanito Donaire is a four weight world champion. He's had a lot of tough fights. He's, fought, uh, he's lost to Rogondo, Jesse Magdalena, and I can't remember the other two fights he's lost. But it's going to be a very, very good fight. Carl Frampton, obviously, um, is he coming up. Lost to Nicholas off. Waters, didn't he? But yeah, go on. Obviously, uh, Nicholas Waters as well. But Carl Frampton, is, is kind of, um, this is a, obviously a tough, tough fight for Carl Frampton. Obviously, we've seen Frampton fight Santa Cruz twice. He's got a quick. And now he's fighting Anita Donaire. Personally, I think it's a 50-50 fight here. But I'm slightly t- uh, leaning towards Frampton. And obviously, should Frampton win this fight, yeah, I've got a feeling he's going to fight Oscar Valdez. Now, I'm going, if I'm going to choose a winner, I'm going to go with Frampton to win on points. Uh, and then Oscar, fight Oscar Valdez. Right, um, you know, like I say, on Frampton's last performance, I would favour Nonito Donaire because Nonito Donaire would not have looked terrible against that guy that Frampton fought. But anyway, down to this fight here, I believe that Frampton has prepared diligently for this one. I believe that Nonito Donaire also seems like he's got a new, you know, a newfound kind of excitement and drive and motivation for himself as well, coming over here as the challenger, coming over here as the underdog as well. And um, I've actually got some money on the Nito Donaire to win on points. So that's my outside of the podcast prediction, but inside of the podcast, I think I'm going to go with Frampton on points because um, that's what I feel would probably happen. I don't see him stopping Donair. Donair's only been stopped once and like you say, it was against Nicholas Walters when he seemed to be on fire. I don't really think Carl Frampton... Has, has really got that Nicholas Walters kind of power there. So for me, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure about that one. Um, but yeah, Frampton, I see probably getting the points win. It'll be hard for Denaire to end up getting a unanimous decision over in Ireland, I feel. Or Northern Ireland, I should say, to be to be, to be be correct. But yeah, it's, it's going to be a good fight. Um, I, I see it being a distance fight for sure. I don't really see either man taking the other one out, even though Nanito Denaire has got a fantastic left hook. Um, I don't have to remind people about that, what he's done with that before. But yeah, great, great fight. Um, great sportsmanship shown from both men in the build-up, and hopefully it lives up to it. I feel like it will do, though. I think it'll be a great fight. So um, to put you on the spot, Ayaz, let's just say... Amir Khan gets in the ring with LaGreco at the same time as Carl Frampton gets in the ring with Nanito Donaire. You've got Box Nation, you've got Sky, so do I. Who or, or which fight are you watching? If you had to pick out the two, you can watch one live, you can watch one after that you've recorded. Which one I are you watching? I have to watch the Amir Khan fight. Really? Yes. Oh, man. <laughs> You're letting me down. I'm going to go and watch the, the Nanito Donaire and Frampton um, fight card. But... Um, hopefully a lot of the big fights don't clash. Hopefully there's, you know, some early knockouts and some points on the other one. So, uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully it's not too, it's not too bad because I'd like to watch one card and then watch the other card afterwards. But then again, there's also a card in America. So it's going to be a real busy night on Saturday night. Of course, three different huge fight cards, two in the UK and one in the States. Um, so yeah, we've done our prediction on that. We're all going with Frampton on points. Moving over now to the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, New York, USA. This one's going to be shown on Showtime, and it's also going to be shown on Box Nation. Is it on Box Nation, this one, Eyes, or is it Sky? I'm trying to think now. I think it's Sky, isn't it? It's on Sky. Is it on Sky? Yeah, okay. Sky, then. Well, yeah, on this bill here, we have uh, the brother, actually, of Gary Russell Jr., Gary Antoine Russell, 4-0. and His opponent yet to be announced. That's a six-rounder there. 
Uh, we have Roche Warren, 15 and 2. His opponent yet to be announced. That's a 10 rounder there. Fabian Maidana, the brother of Marcos Maidana, 14 and 0. He takes on Mohamed Rodriguez, 11 and 5. Jamal Charlo, 26 and 0, puts his interim WBC world middleweight title on the line against Hugo Centeno Jr., 26 and 1. Um, I believe, I think the WBC said that the um, the the winner of this fight will become mandatory to take on Golovkin. So that's an interesting angle there. Um, Jamal Charlo, though, against Hugo Centeno Jr. Eyes, how do you see that fight playing out? We've gone to the predictions on that also. I'm going to go with Jamal Charlo knockout. Jamal Charlo knockout. All right, the listeners have gone with Jamal Charlo to win by knockout also. Um, You know, Centeno, I suppose he's not really a a hugely popular guy, but he's actually not a bad fighter. He's only got the one loss on his resume, like I say, but um, he's not too bad. I mean, the one loss, yeah, it was by knockout. It was to Maciel Selecki, who's the undefeated Polish guy who's taking on Danny Jacobs in a week's time after after this one. But, um, you know, he was a good fighter. He was a good amateur as well. I think his, his resume, I think he had about 100 fights as an, as an amateur, winning, um, winning about 90 of them. But, yeah, he's, he's a decent fighter himself. He's got 14 knockouts from the 26 wins. So I feel that it's, it's quite a good fight. It's, it's not, you know, in his last fight, he beat Emmanuel Aleem. That was a good knockout there. But, yeah, he's certainly the underdog, and rightly so. But I feel like Jamal Charlo will probably do a real job on him. So I'm going to I'm gonna go with the knockout as well because I think Jamal Charlo is certainly very special. Um, I'd like to see him in a real big test, though, against one of the big bangers, one of the big names at middleweight. But, um, yeah, he's nicely and quite cleverly, I feel, settling into this weight here. That's a 12-round contest, of course. Also on this build, Javante Tank Davies, 19-0, and takes on Jesus Cuellar, 28 and 2. This one's for the WBA Super World Super Featherweight title. Um, this is, if I'm not mistaken, I'm seeing lots of things going around that Javante Davis, if he wins this fight, becomes the youngest ever two time world champion. I'm not quite sure if that's true. Um, I'd have to I'd have to do my homework on that. But yeah, that's an amazing thing to achieve, actually, if that does happen. Um Javante Davis, I as last time out, even though he got the win, he remained undefeated. He seemed to kind of be you know, not really concentrating. He seemed like his mind was elsewhere during the fight. He kept looking up to the ceiling for some bizarre reason. Um, he can't really afford to put a foot wrong, though, with this guy. It could get quite interesting if his mind's not on the job. I still reckon, obviously, Javonta Davis is one of the youngest champions in British uh, in boxing history. Sorry. Um, obviously, he's fighting on Saturday as well. But if I'm going to go win a winner, I'm going to go with Javonta Davis. And they're talking about a fight between him and Lomachenko in the future. Yeah, I mean... I believe it when I see it, but that would be a great fight. Just just to mention here, Jesus Cuellar, he is himself a former world champion. He held the belt for quite a while. He, you know, he defended it a few times as well. He lost, though, last time out against Abner Mares, and he hasn't been in the ring since December 2016, so possibly a little bit of ring rust we may see. Um, also, his loss early on came to Oscar Escandon, so he's really lost to good fighters, to be honest, and he can bang himself as well. 21 knockouts from his 28 wins, but Javante Davis, he's got power himself, hasn't he? 19-0 and 0 with 18 knockouts. Um, how do you see him winning this fight, Ayaz? Sorry if, if, if you said I, I didn't, I missed your, your, your um, method of how he's going to win, Javante. I'm going to go with Javante uh, Davis win by knockout. Javante Davis by knockout. So am I. And so are the listeners. And the main event here, this one again could be really interesting. Adrian Broner, 33 and 3. This is the final fight to mention. He's in a 12 rounder against Jesse Vargas, 28 and 2. It was supposed to be Omar Figueroa, but of course he had to pull out of the fight with an injury. I'm sure he'll be kicking himself. Um, unless it was a leg injury, I'm sure he won't be kicking himself. But yeah, this one's going to be on Showtime as well in the States. It's a Debella show. Um, also, um, Mayweather promotions are involved as well, and so is Tom Brown's TGB promotion. So yeah, quite a good card in all. You know, they it seems like a better card than both of the cards in the UK, to be honest. But yeah, um, Jesse Vargas, has, he's been showing a lot of power of late. He's certainly going to be the much bigger man in there against Adrian Broner. We've heard that Adrian Broner's taking boxing seriously again for like the hundredth time. It's a very hard fight. It's almost a lot of people saying it's a 50-50. How do you see it? Um, I think this is going to be a very, very good fight. Obviously, 
Um, for, personally, for me, this is a must-win fight for Adrian Broner and Jesse Vargas, a make-or-break win fight. Obviously, we've seen Adrian Broner in the social media where he's been doing, like, getting arrested and obviously... Um, he's been he's been done for a couple of times assaulting people. Jesse Vargas, we've seen him training um, going under closed doors. And obviously, Jesse Vargas, we've seen him. Uh, we haven't seen him in a top top fight. Last time we saw him fight was against Manny Pacquiao, where he where he lost the where he's lost his WBO belt. Now, personally, yeah, I think this is a very good fight. If I'm gonna go with a winner, this may shock a lot of people, but I'm gonna go with Jesse Vargas to win on points. Well, I tell you what, it doesn't shock our listeners. That's exactly what they've gone with as well. Um, I I can't see Adrian Broner losing this fight, strangely enough. I feel that even though he hasn't looked great himself, and, and neither really is Jesse Vargas when you talk about the big fights. He lost to, to Manny Pacquiao. Fair enough, he did beat Saddam Ali. He lost to Timothy Bradley before that. And then, you know, before that, he was unbeaten for a while. But Adrian Broner... Obviously, he's coming off the loss to Mikey Garcia, but he didn't disgrace himself in there. Mikey Garcia, like we said earlier, he's a top 10, if not top 5 pound-for-pound fighter. So, that's 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 no shame in losing there. And before that year, he had a close fight with Adrian Granados. He beat Ashley Fiafain. He looked quite good there, but he fouled the weight. Um... I'm going with Broner on points. I know that one thing one thing for sure will, will not happen. Broner will not get stopped. I think he's got a good chin on him. Um, Jesse Vargas, I think, may feel Broner's power. Because one thing that Mikey Garcia said to me was that Broner can really whack. So I feel that he might taste a bit of Broner's power. I know that the fight is made at a catch weight of 144, which is quite interesting. So it's above that, you know, that... Um, um, junior welterweight limit, but it's also below the welterweight limit. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's 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 a strange one because, like I say, I think at first it was supposed to happen at 140 when when we had um, Omar Figueroa in the other corner. But now that Vargas has stepped in, he's had to kind of boil himself down three more pounds from that that normal that he's used to the normal um, 147 limit. So interesting thing about that actually, and I feel that that boiling down those three further pounds I think could play into um, into Broner's hands because he hasn't weighed that light since about 2014 um, Jesse Vargas so yeah I think that could play into Broner's hands not not to the point where I think he could he could come in in real bad shape Vargas and end up getting stopped I feel that his energy will be there and obviously his size is there as well but I think I, I certainly favour Broner in that one, to be honest. I feel that I feel that his shot selection, the way he picks his shots, the way he can stand in the pocket and trade off and land clever shots. And, you know, he, he is good with his defence. His legs aren't the best, but he's good with his defence. I feel that he'll just be pot-shotting Jesse Vargas. And at some points of the fight, I think he'll even be picking Vargas off. Um, and, you know, and, and kind of Vargas will, will, will be found wanting at times in that fight. But, um, yeah, another great fight. I mean... I wasn't too pleased when Vargas jumped in at a late replacement, and I'm very confident. When I kind of talk about that, he jumped in at a late replacement. He's got a ball down to 144 instead of 147. All these things are advantages for Adrian Broner, and and it's further fueling me um, with my confidence that I think Broner's going to win this fight. So I'm pleased here that yourself, I, and the listeners are disagreeing with me. Hopefully I can pick up a point to chase the uh, chase both of your towels, which seem to be very far away. Um, and that's really it, though, for the preview. And I asked just before we bring in guest number two, anything that you want to add at all? No, that's it. Okay, and just before we wrap up part two, there's one last thing to do. That, of course, is... Oh, hang on. Oh, Live, live while we're on air. It's just been announced. Gennady Golovkin will defend his titles on May 5th. They did deliver with that promise that he would still be fighting on that day. He takes on Varnes Martirosian. That fight there... um should be, I mean, it should be decent, you know, with the time that's that's given, really. I don't think there's many people that could have got in there and, and you know, been any better, really, than Marta Rosian. I remember last week when we spoke to Sergio Mora, he said that Marta Rosian should be the one that gets the call. Um, just just quickly, Ayaz, it was, seems mad timing, really, just as we was about to sign out there. Um He's a good fighter, Marta Roche. I remember his fights with Eris Landy Lara. Yeah, that's that's a good fight. You happy with that fight? There's not many other people that could have stepped in. I know that Spike O'Sullivan decided he didn't want to fight because there was all, you know, messing around here and there. There wasn't really many people left on the list. 
personally, uh, I know um, I don't think this is a really good fight, but if um, the fight I really want to see is Billy Joe, but it's all right because um, at least we'll get a bit of the ring roster of Golovkin. Canelo, unlike him, if the rematch ever happens, I still think Golovkin beats him. Yeah, I certainly hope so. Um, Golovkin, like I say, defends his IBO, WBA, Super and WBC World Middleweight titles. Um Van is Martirosian, just for those that may not know. He's never been stopped in his three losses. He lost to Eris Landy Lara, he lost to Jamel Charlo, and he lost to Demetrius Andrade. And if anybody um, hasn't already seen Demetrius Andrade's hilarious, hilarious Canelo video on his page on Twitter, go and check that out. It is hilariously funny. <laughs> it really is. Um, but yeah, that's that's crazy how that just happened while we was on air there. Um, all the very best to both guys there. I like Vanez Martirosian. But like I say, with with you know minimal time to prepare for somebody like Golovkin, I don't see it being a good night for him. He may um, he may get stopped for the first time here. But all the very best to both men. Like I say, and once again, just before we wrap up part two, there's one last thing to do. That of course is to welcome our second guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former U.S. Marine, Olympian, and now professional boxing contender, Mr. Jamel Herring. Jamel, welcome back on the show once again. Hey, man. How you doing, man? Good to be back. It's always good to have you back, my friend. So, Jamel, we last spoke. It was um, just before your last fight. In fact, I think this is actually the fifth time we've had you on our show, which makes you one of the most regular (laughs) fighters that we have on. But, yeah, last time out, obviously, the fight didn't end the way that you wanted it to. Um, Ladarius Miller, who was, unless I'm not mistaken, I think he was an underdog going into that fight. He was able to outpoint you over 10 rounds. Please just assess your performance there, Jamel. What went wrong? Oh uh, man, there's just a lot of things going on um, in the back backstage for, for for starters. I wasn't like I you know me, I never made any excuses, but um that night was just it was just a crazy night in terms of the um how the promotion was going, which uh, we'll we'll get to later because of the reasons why I you know made some changes in my career, but yeah. they, I just didn't I wasn't warm I wasn't warmed up, you know um like I like I needed to in the back because I was rushed for um you know getting to the ring and. At the end of the day, um, like I said, a lot of people who did see the fight, I, they, I felt like I still, you know, just did enough. But obviously not my best, but just enough to pull out, you know, pull out a win, if not a draw. But you know, things happen. You know, you live and you learn. And I just after that, I just told myself I needed to make some changes, not only with my corner, but the, um, the people I was I was doing business with as well. Yeah, absolutely. And just to point out there, that was on a right, well, not a rival promoter show, but you were the away fighter in that, you know, on that show, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. Now, since that loss, like you say, you've decided to make some major career changes, your trainer, your promoter, and even your weight class. But one thing at a time, um, you were invited into camp with Terence Crawford and ended up deciding to change trainer and to now join his gym. Is that right? How's that going? Oh yeah, yeah, that, that's that's exactly right. And um, you know, since I made the change, you know, things have been great. Um, the chemistry, the chemistry is there. Um, I'm, I'm learning some new things. The trainers, all, all the trainers, you know, they they they're really they accepted me in, and um, you know, they, they we all act, act act as a family now. And um, you know, and I'm just excited just to um, you know, have a new, basically like a like a new start to things. And um, that you know, I, I'm just you know, I'm just excited to get back in the ring. And what is that like working alongside arguably the best pound for pound fighter in today's boxing world? Oh man, he's been a great help, man. He's um he's been, you know, like a brother. Yeah, we you know, we, we talk a lot, you know, he he just wants to see me improve. He's also felt that I he felt that I also won the last fight, but he feel that, you know, I didn't I didn't show my best. I didn't showcase my best. So, you know, like I said, he just you know, he he does he has a lot of instructive criticism, but it's always good, you know, he he it's no egos involved. You know, like I said, he he also wants to see me become a world champion, and he's going to, like you say, he's going to stay in my case until that happens. <laughs> and what is Crawford like as a person? Because sometimes he tweets some really funny stuff, and it would appear online that he's quite a character. But sometimes in interviews, he can come across like he doesn't have much of a personality. It's weird. It's kind oh, no, of like no. he's got an he, on and off a, switch. Yeah, man. He's a he's a he's a big kid, man. He's like when we're here in in, in the house for camp. You know, he likes to play around. He likes to do, you know, he likes to joke a lot. You know, you, you, you're probably fine up in here play fighting, wrestling and whatever. But, you know, he, he's a good guy, man. He just, 
he only like he only brings out that other side of him when when people pushes his buttons. But for the most part, throughout the day, you know, he's, he's a real funny character, man. Like I said, if you follow just some of the stuff that I post up on my Instagram or whatever, you get the videos that I post up. You know, you can see that he has a lot of fun, and we just have a um a great a great circle around us. Excellent, man. Excellent. And you've also decided to part ways with Al Heyman, which people may think was a bit crazy. Everyone seems to want to be with him. What are your reasons for doing that? It seemed like you had quite a good relationship with Al, though, because a lot of his fighters don't even have a relationship with him. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, I just felt like, like I said, when you pointed out just a few minutes ago how I was on the, you know, I was on Ladarius. I was basically in his backyard. I was on his promoter's card. You know, it, it was just a lot going on. And I felt that, you know, it was time for me to get a promoter that I had the best interest for me. You know, I felt like I, my back was against the wall the last fight going in. So um, if I was going to make a move in terms of promote, in terms of getting a promoter, why not go, and go with one of the best promoters known today, which is um, Bob Arum and Todd Brink. And um, it was nothing like, it was no bad blood or anything with, with Al Heyman. You know, I still communicate with a lot of the uh, PPC fighters over there in that end, but I just felt like, you know, I had to do what was best for my career because if you're, you're like, who's going who's gonna to look out for me better than me? So I had to do what was, you know, what was best for me at the end of the day. So you feel that maybe with Al, because he's got so many fighters, it was like it was kind of hard to accommodate what was your best interests kind of thing. Exactly. And um, the one main thing, as you see with a lot of um, – Heyman fighters today is um, inactivity. It, it kind of hurts us, you know. It hurts, it hurts any fighter, in my opinion. And the the main thing, but of um, top rank was, you know, to keep me busy. They have a plan. They already have. They have. Um, we have a roadmap mapped out. They know exactly what they want to do, and we're just taking it one one fight at a time. And but at the same time, we're going to have a busy year. Excellent, man, excellent. So like you say, you've signed a contract now with Top Rank with Bob Arum. Any particular reason why it was Top Rank instead of anybody else? Not that, you know, not that joining Top Rank is a bad thing. Like you say, they are probably the best promotional team in the world. Um, We actually we actually came across a, a lot of um, different promoters. Um, we had talks with Tom Laufer, who, you know, who obviously promotes um, Gennady Golovkin. Um, we spoke with um, main events, and you know, I, I was, they actually wanted me to um, fight on Sergey Kovalev's one of his la- his last card in March. We spoke on that, but that didn't that you know that didn't go as planned. We spoke with um, we spoke with Golden Boy and um, Robert Robert Diaz and Everett Gomez. You know, they were interested, but it's just that um, like all those guys were interested, but it was Top Rank who actually made the move to actually do something and put something on paper. So that was um. That's what I went with, you know. Um, we even, like I said, we we even had no issues talking. Um, also, you know, we had a chance to talk with um, Eddie Hearn, you know, in, in in the UK. You know, that was a, that would have been an um, option. But like I said, at the end of the day, um, Bob Allen was in um, top rank in the team. Carl Moretti, those were the guys who, you know, say, you know what? Let's not just give him fight dates. Let's let's just sign him, and we uh, we, we we could do something with him because they believe they they believed in me. Um, like I said, about a few weeks ago, Bob Allen even, you know, gave me a mention on Twitter. And, you know, that's rare for Bob. To, you know, we all know Bob doesn't mention many fighters. But, you know, he has a lot He has a lot of confidence. And, um, you know, he believes that we can do something still. Oh, brilliant, man. Brilliant. And like you say, you're now fighting on the undercard of Linares versus Lomachenko. Another big card. That one is set for May 12th at the Madison Square Garden. Firstly, Jamel. It will be your first time boxing in the MSG in Madison Square Garden, one of the most historic boxing venues in the world. Is that a tick off your bucket list fight in there? Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's crazy because, you know, we all know I'm from New York, but I fought in the boxing, you know, the boxing a couple of times, but I never fought in the Garden yet. So, of course, you know, it's, that's a great honor, not only to fight in that building, but, you know, the, the fight that the, that's headlining alone is a, is a big deal. So, you know, it's just great to be... Um, um, on an event of that level, so I'm just, you know, I'm just excited, and I'm just ready, just ready to handle handle my business. And your opponent is Juan Pablo Sanchez, a Mexican fighter with a record of 30 wins and 15 losses. I don't know too much about him though. He's got a couple guys on his resume that I've looked at that I recognise. But um, do you yeah. know much about the guy, Jamel? Um, I just like I said, I, 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 I've seen a few fights. I believe he was um. Um, he had won the regional title, um, WBC Latino um, champion a few, a couple of years back. 
Um, you know, he for he fought a few, um, a, like I said, a couple of prospects you might um, recognize, like Tatimo Lopez. I think he fought just a couple of months ago or whatever. So basically, like, this fight, you know, with top rank is, is more of a, um, you know, just a measuring stick, just to shake, you know, just to shake up the rust, you know, and, and get back in the swing of things. But um, like um, because right after that, you know, I'm coming back June 9th for the um Terrence Crawford Jeff Horn fight. So you know, like I said, um, when, when I really meant when I really meant that um, Todd Burns keep me busy. They're really keeping me busy, as you see. So, you know, like I said, we're just getting back in the swing of things, May 12th. For, you know, we're not looking to, we're not looking past our opponent because, you know, anything can happen. We don't want to take any, you know, injuries, cuts, and bruises that are preventing me from getting back in the ring. So, like I said, we're, we're, taking, this, we're taking this fight just as serious as any other fight. So you say there you'll be fighting June 9th, which is only, obviously, a few weeks after that. Um, I'm not trying to sneakily get a prediction um from you here, but unless you knock your opponent out, will you still be pleased with your performance? Um, I think I, you know, like I said, I was been a hard, you know, um, I was judged my uh, um, performance is very hard, so I don't think I'll be pleased if I don't stop him. If I do a lot of damage, you know, whatever, but I, I, my main goal, you know, I want to, at the end of the day, I, wanna, I still want to stop my opponent, so I can, like you said, take less risk and I'm still gain more reward, not only from myself personally, but from my, um, my new promoter as well. So you know, uh, plus you know, if you look at his record, he hasn't been. I think I believe he hasn't been stopped since 2012. So um, you know, I'm trying to you know, end 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 that run with a uh, with a knockout. And um, you kind of say there that you know Bob Arum didn't just present to you a deal. He he presented to you kind of like a a plan, if you like, to 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 get back. Yeah. You know, this fight happening here May 12th, the fight after that June 9th, is there any, you know, I know that you probably can't tell us too much, but is there anything that you can tell us that goes on further from that? Is there like a, a plan to have, a, you know, a certain amount of fights before trying to go for one of the title lists at, at 140? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I guess I can, I can speak a little bit on that. Um, For like starting for this fight, you know, the plan is to get us ranked, either either this fight or the next fight. And we're, we want to get ranked in as many sanctioned bodies. People, you know, who who recognize top rank, they always believe that, you know, the WBO title is the main title that stays the top rank, you know, which is true to a certain degree. But like I said, we, we want to get ranked in as many sanctioned bodies as possible and then, you know, explore our options. And then uh, later on, we'll probably go for a regional title um, and then afterwards a world title. So we're just play, you know what I'm saying? We're just, they basically have, a, um, you know, like I said, a plan set out. We don't know it. Like I, I personally don't know exactly which route they want to take me. I was just I was told by my um my handlers though, maybe about a week ago that um they want to see what I do this fight and the next fight in June to basically to get a real good idea of which direction we're going to uh, we're going to for and um basically they like, you know which which world champion you know that we want to go out there as well. So like I said, my um, my my two my performances in May and June basically to determine what what happens next. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Obviously, right now, the WBO title is vacant. Did you hear the news that Mikey Garcia just vacated the IBF as well? Oh, yeah, he's, he's, he's going to defend the WBC title. Um, like I said, it's was, it was just not as a bad idea. Like, I, I, I would have personally liked to see him fight, you know, some other guys that won 40, you know. But um, you see, if you got, you know, between the, the winner of um, Lomachenko and Linares, you know, you can probably do something big with that. Um, he he works with Heyman, so he has, he has the possibility of still you know unifying with Robert Easton Jr. Yeah, and um, like I said, um, Ray Beltran is still out there, so you know what I mean. There's it's, it's a lot of it's a lot of ways you can go. So we'll just have to see basically at the May 12th because um, you know that, that everybody's looking at that fight between Lomachenko and Linares to see which um what 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 will happen next. Yeah, very, very good fight. And the final question that I've got for you, Jamel. Uh, this weekend, your former gym mate Adrian Broner takes on Jesse Vargas, a man that you fought in the amateurs. Who do you believe wins that fight? A really good fight. I'm mean, like I said, I'm not gonna be biased because I'm close with Adrian, so I can't, I can't really call it because the main reason I can't. I mean, we like we wasn't too happy with his, uh, his, his with his performance against Mike Garcia, of course. Um, but. My Let me just interrupt you is, um, quickly there, Jamel. Um, I spoke yeah. to Mikey Garcia on that fight, and one thing that Mikey Garcia said was, and I was quite surprised actually. He said that Adrian Broner can really punch for that weight. Yeah, yeah, and and, and that's true. And his, his biggest flaw is his activity. His activity level it, it, it hurts him, and that's why that's what I was getting to. Like my main thing is for this fight, I just want to see 
you know, with his new, with, with his also this new um, change of um, trainers and, and everything on his situation, I just want to see the differences and changes they they um they made to him more mentally than anything, you know, because um he has the tools, he has the strength, but as you know, he has to put it all together and he has to be he has to be active and, and consistent each and every round, and and you know, I'm real. I, I, like I, I say, I would say I have a real good relationship with Jesse Vargas as well, and um, you know Jesse's really, he's he's hungry. You know he wants he wants to um the guys and, and the ones with the vision like you know Keith Thurman. He wants to he wants to crack at another world title as well, and I respect that. My only thing that I that I have from about Jesse is um you know his last performance he had a guy in front of him that many of us thought that he should have got out, got out of there early and he just let him linger around long enough than expected. So you know we we'll have to see because I feel like if he doesn't you know, get Adrian respect early in, in the fight. You know, it might be a long, it might be a long night for him. So you know, we'll, we'll just have to see how it plays out. Yeah, I, I favor Adrian Broner to be honest in that one. I think that um, you know the fact that obviously Vargas was kind of thrown in as a bit of a late replacement, not too late because he still had quite a while to prepare. Yeah. But you know, it's at one forty four. It's at a catch weight, so he's going to have to come down yeah. there. He's a much bigger guy. I, I, I just. I really favour Broner in that one. But anyway, last thing that I've got for you, Jamel, anything that you want to say at all before I let you go? I'd like to give you an opportunity to say anything you like, so take it away. Oh, man, I just want to just say thank you for just having me on again. And, um, you know, we all know I will be back on the show again. So the next time we talk, uh, hopefully we'll have, like I said, you'll have more answers to what, what we spoke about earlier with this whole top ring deal. And I have, you know, and I want to let you, you know, I want you to be basically one of the first to know you know, the plan that we're going to since, you know, you and I have been really close over over the years now. And, um, you know, I want, like I said, I want to give you that, that respect to let you know to break the news to you first. So I just want to thank everybody out there listening. And, you know, I, like I said, I, I, somebody asked me about a week ago if I, if I wanted to fight in the U.K. And hell yeah. I mean, like I said, I, I, loved, I loved the U.K. when I was out in the 2012 Olympic, you know, Olympic Games in London. And so I'm like, why not? But just like Errol Spence told Kel Brook last week, you know, why not? You know, the U.K., the UK atmosphere is great. No one, no one beats it. Not even in the US. Point in blank. But um, you know, like I said, if anybody wants to reach out to me, they can just hit me up on Twitter, Instagram at Jamel Henry. And thank you again. Hey, thank you, my friend. Thank you. Listen, Jamel, it's always a pleasure. Best of luck for May twelfth. Thank you for your time, and I will speak to you after your fight, or maybe on Call of Duty at some point soon. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get yeah, we'll get back on it, bro. Okay, and this wraps up episode 131 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. I as Sumra has been I as Sumra. A big thank you to our two guests on this week's show, the new WBA international champion, Mr. Josh Kelly, and the former Marine Olympic boxer and now top-ranked prospect, Mr. Jamel Herring. Thank you all once again for listening. It's just come out that Canelo has been given a six-month ban by the Nevada State Athletic Commission. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. More on that next week best of luck with the predictions this week for everybody involved enjoy your weekends people and we shall see you all next week